Welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming. We're delighted to have you. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dustin Ingram, who is uh, going to talk to us today about building a sustainable Python package index. Make our speaker welcome, please. Hey, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. I haven't been to Australia before, so I'm excited to be at PyCon Australia for the first time. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to talk to you today about building a sustainable Python package index. So I'm Dustin. Uh, I am a developer advocate at Google. Uh, I'm the organizer for PyTexas, which is a conference in the States. And I'm also one of the maintainers of the Python package index. And I'm here today to answer the most important question about the Python package index, which is, how do you pronounce that? <laughs> all right, the answer is pi, P-I. And I made this handy graphic for all of you just so you can remember it. <laughs> all right, so not pi, pi, not anything else, pi, P-I. Uh, so today, all right, I'll go back if anyone wants to tweet that ridiculous photo. I don't know why that costume exists. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what PyPI is and what PyPI is not. Uh, and I'll talk to you a little bit also about how PyPI works. So both from a technical perspective as an organization and financially, like what keeps PyPI running. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how we can improve PyPI or what we're doing to improve it right now. So some things that PyPI is. Um, PyPI is the canonical repository for Python software. It is the place to put third party uh, Python software. Uh, has anyone ever been asked this question in an interview? What happens when you type google.com in your browser and press enter? Right? It's kind of a classic maybe interview question. PyPI is part of the answer to the question, what happens when you type pip install Django into your terminal and press enter? Right? So you type pip install Django and pip you know, does a little bit of behind the scenes work, figures out that the software that you want doesn't exist on your local machine, and then it reaches out to PyPI. This is PyPI. Except this is not what PyPI looks like when pip talks to it. It looks kind of like this, which is a mess. Uh, so if you look at the source to this, this is every single package name on PyPI as a link to a package page. If you follow those links for Django, you get this list of um, file names, Django and version numbers. Uh, and if you follow those links, it'll take you to an actual distribution file that's on pythonhosted.org. So, PyPI is basically just this huge list of links with very, very, very specific file names. And that's it. There's some other stuff on top too, but that's really at the core of what the package index is. Another thing that PyPI is, PyPI is old. It's been around for quite a while. The first commit to PyPI was in 2002. Um, this is what it looked like in 2003. So Python was created a little bit before this in, in the 90s. And so PyPI didn't actually even exist when uh, Python was first created. So hence, we, we call Python like a batteries included language. We have a lot of stuff in the standard library because PyPI didn't exist back then. However, even though it didn't exist when Python was created, it still is pretty old and predates a lot of other um, package repositories for other languages. Uh, so it's, it's sort of one of the first and it's been around for quite a while. PyPI isn't a number of things as well. So one thing that people sometimes get confused about with PyPI, PyPI is not a collection of audited software. PyPI is basically the Wild West. Anybody can publish anything on PyPI that they want uh, with no verification, right? Like you and I could upload something today that does literally anything that I want. And you should be aware that when you install a package, it can do literally anything that it wants. So it's this open package repository that anyone can submit anything to. It's kind of like GitHub. Uh, but PyPI also is not literally GitHub. So some languages and ecosystems, such as um, Go, they just use third-party um, uh, source mod uh, revision control systems as their package ecosystem. So if you install a Go module, you're going to tell it to go to GitHub and get the source from there. Uh, and this is sort of unlike PyPI, where we have this central repository for package. PyPI also isn't a for-profit organization. So some other language communities, uh, such as the JavaScript ecosystem, their central package manager, NPM, is a for-profit company. That company uh, has like more than $10 million in VC funding, has like 60 employees, uh, and uh, this is the, the equivalent for PyPI in that ecosystem. We don't have that. PyPI is not like that. 
it's a nonprofit. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you how to build a PyPI in five easy steps, okay. So the first thing is you're gonna define some APIs. So that list of giant links that I showed you before, that's what we call the simple API. It's really like the simplest thing possible, uh, the way to build this de decision tree for what package, what version, and where is the file. There's an upload API. This is how you get code and packages onto PyPI. There's some JSON, XML RPC APIs for interacting with PyPI programmatically. And then we also have a web UI for doing like account management and stuff like that. Step two is you're gonna implement all these APIs. So the way we did this, it's Python 3, it's a pyramid web framework. We use some pretty standard Postgres, Redis, some Kubernetes, just a little sprinkle of JavaScript and CSS because we're Python developers and we don't really know how to do JS and CSS that well. Step three is put all of that behind a big honking CDN, which is a content distribution network. And the reason for this is a super important part of building a PyPI is because PyPI is extremely popular. It is the canonical repository for Python code. So this is a screenshot I took yesterday of uh, our backend of our CDN. Uh, and in the last year, PyPI has served 160 billion requests. And it's transferred almost two petabytes of data in the last year. Uh, that's a lot, that's huge. And then if you looked at the like sort of real-time statistics for our CDN right now, um, you'd see that PyPI is receiving something like six to 7,000 requests per second. A lot of people are installing a lot of packages and transferring a lot of data from PyPI at any given moment. And the other thing is PyPI is growing as well. All these are trending upward, including the size of PyPI itself, the size of all the files uploaded to it. Nothing really ever gets deleted from PyPI, so it's only ever gonna grow. Uh, so the mirror size is now at like almost seven terabytes of, of software, it's like huge. Okay, so step four is, I don't know, and step five is profit. But really, actually, step four is like, try to make all that sustainable. And step five is, hope that you break even in the end. So that's sort of where we're at today. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how we can make PyPI sustainable from a couple perspectives. The first is technically. So like I said, PyPI is this critical piece of infrastructure for the Python community. It absolutely has to exist. Uh, it's in the dependency chain for basically every Python deployment of every software all around the world for every Fortune whatever company. Uh, so it's super important that not only that it works, but it continues to work and will continue to work for the foreseeable future. So there's a couple like guiding principles that uh, I use when I'm designing software to last a long time. And they're these, and we can apply these all directly to PyPI. So the first is longevity. It has to be around. It has to exist in a certain way that it will continue to exist. It has to be maintainable. So as an open source project, it has to, you have to be able to come in and work on it, change it, adapt it to the uh, growing needs of the future. It needs to be transparent. So this is basically why it's an open source project. We need anyone to be able to see uh, what PyPI is doing, how it works, and be able to come and work on it. It needs to be evolvable. So it needs to meet new demands and change as time comes along. And it needs to be scalable. So like I said, PyPI is growing and it is not going to slow down. So PyPI needs to be able to address the, the growing amount of uh, demand that it's gonna have on it. So a couple of things we do here to build a sustainable PyPI, technically. First, using the latest and greatest. So this means that um, PyPI is built with Python 3 we generally have the latest dependencies. So PyPI has a lot of dependencies. We try to upgrade them as quickly as possible. We don't want it to get, to turn into the stale code base that has an old version of Python, uh, old version of this dependency, an old version of that dependency, and get so out of date that no one wants to bring it back up to date. Another is while we're using the latest and greatest, we're not using anything super weird. Basically everything that we use to build PyPI or every dependency that we have is more or less the status quo, what the community has dis decided to be uh, you know, a, a good web framework or a good database. I'm not gonna use anything super esoteric or something bizarre just because it seems interesting. Um, and this lends towards maintainability, right? If it's stuff that the community is already uh, familiar with and, and used to building, then it makes it easier for people to come and work on it. Again, everything is open source for PyPI, and this makes it sustainable because anyone can come and work on it, and uh, it, it's, you know, transparent to exactly everyone that wants to work on it. Uh, along the lines of maintainability, PyPI, we focus on having a really strong local development experience as well. So if you're a PyPI contributor 
uh, I can get PyPI, a version of it, running up on your computer with Docker installed almost instantly. It requires very little configuration, and that lowers the, the barrier for new contributors and for entrants, people that want to work on it. Uh, another thing that helps with technical sustainability is tests. We write a lot of tests. Tests prevent us from breaking things going forward, uh, creating breaking changes, uh, and actually PyPI has a lot of tests. PyPI has like actually 100% test coverage, which when I talk to people about PyPI, they're like, that's insane. Why, why would you even bother to have 100% test coverage? 100% um, test coverage is kind of like not always guaranteed to fix all the bugs, right? Just because you cover all the code paths doesn't mean that everything is technically correct. Uh, however, there is this uh, additional advantage to just having a lot of code coverage, and that's uh, we can really easily make changes and be sure that they're not going to break existing behavior. And it also requires new features to have a certain level of investment. So you can't just sort of code cowboy into PyPI and write a feature and make a PR and say it's ready to go. You actually have to write tests, 100% coverage tests, for that feature to ensure that it's working as you expected uh, before it gets merged. So while that does sort of slow down how quickly we can build features, it also makes sure that we're only really building the features that are absolutely necessary and require the right amount of investment. As far as scalability, we designed PyPI to be really read-heavy and cacheable. So this allows us to offload a lot of the um, like hard work that PyPI has to do onto our CDN. So this means also that PyPI is really resi resilient to downtime. Uh, I could take PyPI down right now, and I have before accidentally, and, <laughs> and you probably wouldn't notice because almost like if you saw that stat uh, the graphs before, like 99% of our requests actually hit the CDN and don't actually make it to our backend. So it's really resi resilient, and that means that us as maintainers can sort of uh, step back and not have to carry a pager necessarily. It's probably going to continue to work just fine, even if there's a slight problem. Now let's talk about maintainers. Uh, so let's talk about organizational stability or sustainability. And so I said before that we are not a nonprofit, so or we're, we're not a for-profit. What are we? Well, we're a nonprofit. So PyPI is a project of the Python Software Foundation, because we all know how sustainable that nonprofits are, right? Uh, so this is actually great for us because that means that we exist under this umbrella of the Python Software Foundation, whose mission is to further advance Python, and PyPI is definitely part of that. Um, PyPI is also run almost entirely by volunteers because we know how sustainable volunteers are as well. Uh, so there's a sort of a, a cadre of people that work on PyPI. So there's a few administrators, Donald Stuffed, Ernest, and I all um, get part of our time as our day-to-day -day jobs to work on PyPI. Uh, we also have some other maintainers who occasionally also get paid to work on PyPI. So Nicole is our UI UX, Sumina is our project manager. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, we also have some moderators. So these are people that are just totally volunteers, but they help respond to user requests, triage issues, um, and handle other things like uh, 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 other, other administrative issues on PyPI. And we also have like 200 individuals that have actually committed changes to PyPI as well. And all these people are part of this group of volunteers that makes it run. The thing about volunteers is uh, for all these people, there's basically three things that mean that they can work on PyPI. Either someone's company is paying them to work on open source, and we've gotten lucky and they've decided to work on PyPI. Uh, someone's unemployed and they're just bored, and so they've come to PyPI to spend some time. Or someone is not getting enough sleep. They both have a job, and they uh, you know, want to work on PyPI anyway, and they're not getting paid to do it. I've been all three of these. So uh, yeah, this is not exactly sustainable, but it's sort of the best that we have right now. Uh, and there's some other things that we can do uh, financially to make this a little bit better as well. Let's talk about financial stability, sustainability. So PyPI exists almost entirely on in-kind donations from its sponsors. So we, for things like metrics, alerting, search, we get donations from companies like Datadog, Sentry, and Elastic. Um, for Compute, this is AWS and GCP. And for our CDN, this is Fastly. And we depend a lot on all these sponsors, but we especially depend a lot on Fastly. Uh, and I just want to take a quick moment to shout out to Fastly right here. Fastly. Our like, bill that we don't pay to Fastly every month is like $200,000. It's almost $2.5 million a year. Fastly donates this and has donated this for years now as an in-kind donation. So Fastly is awesome. Thank you, Fastly. Uh, 
Uh, and that's especially poignant in comparison to the way that PyPI makes cash. So we have uh, individual donors. This totals about, we just added this up yesterday actually, $250 a month. Not $250,000 a month, $250 a month. So uh, this is not what's sustaining PyPI. What's sustaining PyPI, and, and while these, to be said, these in, individual donors, we appreciate every dollar, and having uh, some income for PyPI is really important. Um, but PyPI exists almost entirely on the backs of all the sponsors that have donated services to us. And so we also sort of need a way to work on PyPI at, and not just have services donated to us. So when we add new features, like these sponsors aren't donating new features to us. They're not paying anyone to work on PyPI. Uh, we need another way to do that. And that way to do that is our grants and awards. Um, so just this is something that you know a year ago we weren't really doing with PyPI, and then we just sort of started doing it. So one example is I showed you the screenshot. This is PyPI in 2003. This is PyPI in uh, 2007, and then this is it 10 years later in 2018. These are like almost, they look exactly the same. It hasn't changed much in those last 10 years, and it's not really fair to say like PyPI didn't change in 10 years, because one thing that actually that you can't tell from these screenshots is that PyPI went from about 2,000 projects to more than 50,000 projects in that time period. It really grew uh, almost exponentially. Um, but basically, we decided that PyPI, the code base that we had written for PyPI was no longer serving the best needs of the community, and we needed to, to rewrite it. We started a total full stack rewrite. This is Warehouse, if you guys have ever heard of the sort of code name for what PyPI is now. Uh, but this effort stalled basically because of the, um, f the fact that we were all volunteers, didn't have a lot of people to work on it full time. Basically, you know, we could slowly chip away at features, but we weren't going to get to the point where it was ready to release. Uh, so what we did is we went to Mozilla. Mozilla has uh, their open source support awards, and we applied for an award. And we got the award. Mozilla gave us this award. Uh, they gave us $170,000, and that let us hire full-time two developers, a UI UX contractor, and a project manager. And we launched a new PyPI. Uh, in a couple months, with that um, amount of funding, we were able to finish the new code base and launch and release it. Um, and now that is the PyPI that we all know and love. So this was a huge success for us. Um, we got a certain amount of money, we had a goal, and we finished it. And it actually finished um, in April of last year. We're going to keep doing this. So right now we're in the process of working on uh, the Open Technology, uh, Open Technology Fund grant that we received. Uh, we did the same thing. We applied for some improvements for PyPI, and they gave us some money. Uh, and we're in progress on shipping this right now. So uh, the Open Technology Fund, they gave us $80,000 with the goal of building more secure features and accessibility uh, for, for PyPI, and it's almost finished. So actually, um, just recently, we launched support for two-factor authentication for PyPI, thanks to this work. Uh, and we also just recently, like last week, merged support for API tokens. So you, instead of using your username and password, you can upload packages with API keys instead. And we're going to keep doing this. So we got an award from Facebook. It hasn't started yet. It's $100,000 to do cryptographic package signing and launch. And again, going to keep doing it. So maybe you want more sustainability. Maybe you want like a for-profit PyPI, uh, which could have things like private repositories. This is a question that I get over and over again. You know, if PyPI has set these sustainability problems, why don't we just turn it into a for-profit organization? We have all these great features. Uh, so there's some challenges here. One, it's a challenge to our nonprofit status. We start doing for-profit things, uh, and we might lose our nonprofit status with the US government, and that would be not good for Python in general. Second is our donated services. So we uh, rely on a lot of donated services. We start making money, they might step away. There's also a current ecosystem of tools and packages that depend on PyPI, uh, sort of filling the gaps in these features that we don't have. So we start fulfilling them, they might suffer as well. And our volunteers. We can't really expect volunteers to start working for a company that's making money if we're not paying them. And the transition itself would be challenging as well. Turning a, uh, something that exists as a nonprofit into for profit would be really hard. And actually, like, maybe this isn't even a good idea for a package registry. So NPM right now is suffering um, and it maybe not succeeding, um, maybe due to it, the, its, its uh, organizational structure. So NPM's having a lot of layoffs and actually, it's, uh, this title's funny, but its CEO just, just left recently. Okay, so if you want more sustainability for PyPI, this is what I suggest you do. Donate. We don't get a lot of donations, but they do count. 
you can donate your money to uh, python.org slash bsf slash donations. But more importantly, you can donate your time as well. And, and that's arguably more valuable. So you could go to Warehouse and make contributions. Uh, you can become a moderator and eventually maybe become a maintainer and move along. Uh, we'd really appreciate all that as well. If you want to work on PyPI, I have these stickers. They're really fun contributor stickers. You can uh, merge a pull request, and I will give you one. And uh, yeah, that's all. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so we have time maybe for one or two quick questions. Anybody in the audience? One over here, OK. If you can stand up and come to the aisle, it's a really big room. We might give you more time for an answer. Thank you. Uh, so the, you listed the challenges of going from non-profit to for-profit. Presumably NPM had the same sort of challenges. Uh, what, what's different between PyPI and NPM that, that uh, you can't solve it the same way they did? Uh, I don't believe NPM ever transitioned from a non-profit to a for-profit. I think the company started as a, as a for-profit startup. That the goal was to be the package manager for the JavaScript ecosystem. Yeah, I kind of breezed through it, but I mean, it's, it's just really challenging to figure out the, the structure and the flow for money for you know, the change from a nonprofit to a to for profit organization. Yeah. I don't know how relevant that this will be, but um, I have been thinking of uh, putting a pi 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 package into PyPy, and um, I don't have any code, but I well, names are hard, and I picked two names, and they are empty packages right now. Mm -hmm. I just got the two names reserved for, you know, whatever. Um, I'm only going to use one of them, though, right? The other very good name will be unused, and I don't know how to give up the, uh, <laughs> Sell the ownership eBay. of that name <laughs> to for someone else to use. Donate the money to Pi Pi. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a process for that. I can I can talk you through. But basically, uh, yeah, and that's one of the, the issues with PyPI being so old and having a flat namespace is that um, yeah, package names are, are getting you know sort of eaten up. Um, but yeah, we do have a process for releasing uh, unused and defunct package names. One last very quick question: uh, Is it a priority at all cleaning up all abandoned projects on PyPI or getting rid of? projects for whatever other reason, um, or is it just a, a case, well, the whole thing's going to keep growing and we're going to keep having enough space and, yeah, we don't care <laughs> about those projects? Yeah, so like I said, the, the package names is a problem because there's a finite amount of those. Uh, and actually, the way PyPI works is you can't re-release a certain uh, version of a package with a certain distribution type. It's Once you do it, uh, it can never be released again. Uh, so even if we release package names, that won't uh, fix that problem. Um, so yeah, I think generally the way that we approach it is someone is maybe depending on that software, even if that project looks abandoned. And actually, uh, if, you're, if you're sort of following along in the Python community, a prominent maintainer recently deleted a bunch of his um, packages that he thought were totally unused and he had deprecated for several years. And a bunch of people came out of the woodwork and said, hey, we need those They're dependencies for our projects. Please put them back. Um, so yeah, it's unlikely that uh, us as maintainers are going to go through and sort of cull the cruft. Um, but what we might do is find, make it easier for people to determine what is and isn't abandoned, and what's actually generally being continued to being supported, and what the community is using, so that those packages that are abandoned sort of, you know, they don't disappear, but they become less prominent. All right, thank you. Let's thank Dustin one more time. We have a thank you. Thank you.